listening to History Man, a project of ekbarns.com, where we walk in the footsteps of heroes and proclaim freedom reigns. On today's podcast, we're talking again with Dr. Eric Nason, a resident of Sumter, South Carolina, who is the author of In the Presence of Wolves, The Adventures of Ranger Jacob Clark. Welcome, Eric. Thank you, sir. Eric, we talked on our previous podcast, talked a little bit about uh, your book and uh, how our listeners can, can get your book Let's, on Amazon and what were some of the other places they could... Barnes and Nobles. Of course, you can go to the publisher through both Mascot Books for the first one, which is In the Presence of Wolves, or Strategic Book Publishing for In uh, the Fury of Wolves. And so this is a series. This yes, isn't sir. just a one and done type of type of. Uh, no, sir. Right work. now it's planning to be about a five book series. You have a huge background in history from the time you were growing up in upstate New York. Uh, tell the listeners a little bit about your genesis has made you Dr. Eric Nason. Well, I started again. I live in upstate New York, a place called Glens Falls, which is about an hour north of Albany. I, I grew up in the midst of the Rogers Rangers tale. I'm Fort Edward. Bloody Pond, Lake George, Fort William Henry, Last of the Mohicans. I lived a couple blocks from Cooper's Caves, uh, Fort Sar- Saratoga Battlefield, Fort Ticonderoga. I lived it. I breathed it. I, as a kid, I, I would run through the woods and the mountains and the, and the forest. So it was really easy for me when I, when I graduated from high school. I joined the Army, and the first unit I was assigned to was the 2nd Ranger Battalion. So I became a true Ranger. I served there for about three and a half years before I decided, okay, I'll take it to the next level and volunteered for Special Forces training and would spend the rest of my career as a special forces operator in certain, certain areas. So as I'm going through, I, I was working well. I love history. How about I work on some degrees? So I got a bachelor's in world military history, master's on the American Revolution, and my doctorate's teaching history. I actually ran into you at the Francis Marion Symposium that is held every year down in Manning, South Carolina, uh, and was privy to your talk there and and the uh, the camaraderie that you had with all the other historians there and the authors there, and uh, you're held in very uh, high regard in the Southern campaigns of the American Revolution, and I appreciated your talk. For our listeners, if you ever have a chance to talk to or listen to Dr. Eric Nason, you will come away energized, even if you're not a real historian, even if you're not into history, you're going to come away with a with a passion for his take on history and, and his, uh, his knowledge and how he has immersed himself into, into a lot of that. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, at that symposium, you spoke about uh, some of the, the battles around Charleston before Charleston fell. And I'd like our listeners to, to hear some of that as a lead up to Stono Ferry, which was a huge pinnacle moment, Stono Ferry, where you had a lot of the militia from the upstate of South Carolina actually involved in Stono Ferry. And uh, when you look at their pension records, you will see, you know, this list of different battles they're in. And and inevitably, you're going to see Stono Ferry, Ferry. Stono Ferry. So uh, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about those. As it is 2019, it is actually the 240th anniversary. Just like now, we're getting ready for the 250th, but for us here in the South, we're still focusing on our 240th anniversary. This actually event began actually in 1779 when we lost Georgia. Uh, The British were in a stalemate. They're going nowhere in New York. They're going nowhere in New England. They had tried one shot at us before in 76, and we held them off, you know, really harsh off of Solomon's Island on on June 22nd. So they decided to reinvest again, but this time they got a little bit smarter. They said, we're not going to go to South Carolina. We'll go to Georgia. So they landed. Uh, Colonel Campbell was able to take Savannah very quickly without a whole lot of uh, resistance. And then General Prevost marched up from St. Augustine, Florida. So they decided we need to secure all of Georgia. So he sent uh, General Campbell up to Augusta. Well, that put General Lincoln under a lot of pressure. He was the commander of the Southern Department. Here they are. He just lost an entire colony in one swift move. So he had to do something. So by February of 1780, he had moved his forces, a good majority of the Continental Army with all of the militias, with the exception of the Second South Carolina, a few other the elements, he moved to the border to observe what was Prevost going to do. Prevost was on one side, and he saw with Campbell being up at Augusta, he saw an opportunity. So about March, he decided that he's going to march three quarters of the whole Southern Army north to Augusta, Georgia leaving only uh, Francis Marion under the com- in command of his, of what's left. We only had about 200 men in the 2nd Regiment at this time, so they were spread out along Black Swamp. You had uh, General Moultrie trying to figure out what to do. He's trying to watch all these different crossings, and then we had a few militia guys still holding the city. 
They had an Indian raid, was what they called it was an Indian. It was loyalists who came, Georgia loyalists, attacked one of the outposts. They may have been trusted Indians, but they really used the bayonet really, really well. So they figured they were actually loyalists, uh, right. trained, but right. dressed as Indians. But it was enough that it forced the men back that we realized something was about to happen. Can I, can I stop you for just one second? Let me ask you, let me get clarify something here for, for my benefit, maybe for the listeners, I don't know. Um, the loyalists, when they sign up with the British, okay, when the militia sign up, they're signing up for maybe even just a battle, yes. just a, just an incident, a couple months, maybe three months, you know, the two months in between the, you know, three months in between the planting and the mm-hmm. harvesting, whatever. I mean, they're, sometimes they're even just signing up for, okay, we're, we're told to go here, go, told to go there. Is that the same way with the loyalists? Oh, no. When the loyalists sign up, is for the duration. Now, you have two different types of loyalists. You have what's called provincial soldiers which are regular British soldiers. They wear a British red uniform, normally with green facings, but they're Americans. They're from the colonies. Loyalists are a little bit more dedicated. They are militia groups for the most part. They do fall under the same rule. That generally, they only fly for one battle, but what we have seen for the most part is the loyalists will stay with the army as long as they're winning. They'll stay with them for the duration. So it's interesting because... Whereas the British had this almost a cohesive force with them everywhere they went, the Americans, especially from the militia yeah. standpoint, they're coming and going. It's and, piecemeal. And peace, people like Francis Marion, who's trying to lead this this group, he can't even count on a certain number of people being in his camp at any given time. Correct. So when Lincoln leaves Charleston to go up to Augusta and leaves Moultrie and Marion behind, you can't even say that he's no. got. You can't say that he's got a good force with him no, at the time. Not at all. That's and even Governor Rutledge, he's up in Orangeburg, so okay. he's not even in the city. Right. And right. So they're watching to see what General Prevost did, and everyone was considering, you know, standard military strategy. You got to draw the army away from. So they kept on saying that as they received word, they had friends in Georgia saying the army is marching. We're seeing Prevost march, and it's a large force. They kept sending the messages to General Lee. He goes, ignore it. It's a feint. They're just trying to, to, to lure us out. I'm staying here in Augusta. When uh, Prevost came across, it was very evident that it was no longer a feint. He had about 2,000 men to include. He had uh, the regular loyalists. He had provincials. He had Hessians. He had regulars to include the 71st Highlanders. He had six pieces of artillery. He had three six-pounders and three three-pounders. You're coming for a fight if you're carrying that much. You're not just doing right. it. Originally, he did had thought about just doing a raid, get some food, but then he realized there's no obstacles between him. So is he coming from Savannah? Beaufort? He's actually coming up from Savannah. He's from Savannah. He's has to, he has to cross the Savannah, Savannah River. River. So he's got to have the Navy involved in this. He had gunboats. He had gunboats. So they actually crossed on foot. They oh. crossed at a 40. He found an area that was concealed that by the time he got most of his forces across... They didn't realize he had actually found another crossing point. We had not watched it. When you say he came across on foot, they lined the gunboats up and then walked No, he walked through the water. Okay. They, they actually walked through the water holding their muskets and bags over their heads. Across and the Savannah River. Across the river, yes, sir. Okay, all right. Yep, and they got him across. In some places they had boats. I mean, with the artillery, you're going to have to use rafts. Sure. But for the most part, any, any place they could find, it was just one of these areas so concealed, no one realized it, and he was already on the South Carolina side when they found him. I guess when I'm thinking about Savannah, I'm thinking about the port. The port. And uh, we're not ta- was river. there a fall line somewhere? Yeah, you up? go up upriver, yes, up sir. Upriver, and there was a fall line they came across. So right. uh, we're not talking about crossing right no, there at the port. not no, at I mean, all. At the, at the port. Okay. So, so he got through. So he came across, and he just keeps going. He keeps going. Because he doesn't get any resistance. He got a little bit of resistance. Uh, we tried at the Tipicano. We actually had some of our men hold, but Moultrie was looking at the terrain. Goes, it's nothing but swamp, and we have a couple passes here, and we have no artillery. Okay. So he asked for support. He asked for reinforcements from Lincoln. He asked for reinforcements from the governor. We need artillery. No one was coming. So he looked at the terrain. Goes, I'm falling back to a, a little bit better defensive position. He only left a small token force under the Fifth South Carolina at the Tipicano. Byron fell back. Well, the, what reinforcements did arrive was. Colonel John Lawrence and his North Carolina Line Infantry. And all that all that Moultrie asked for is, I left a company forward. Can you go get my men to protect them before they get encircled and bring them back? So Lawrence goes forward with, uh, with another rifle company. to says, hey, you're supposed to come back. But he looks at the line and he decides that he's going to make a stand right there on the swamp. 
no artillery, just muskets. Even, uh, and this was the, the commander was of the, of the fifth, like, are you sure this, there's nothing here to defend? And he decided we're going to do it here, and he formed his men line of battle. Prebo saw that, goes, okay, and he rolled up all six pieces of artillery and opened fire. He didn't have to, he, did, was, he knew better than to try to commit his men to a fight in the swamp. It's to his disadvantage, but he had artillery, which was his advantage, and we had none. Lawrence was wounded. His horse was actually shot off from underneath him. Uh, he got wounded in the arm. As soon as he was pulled off, all the Continental Commanders said, okay, we're evacuating, and they fall back to, to Moultrie, and Moultrie realizes we can't stop him. So he does a guerrilla campaign. He asks his Mary and everything else, I need you to start destroying every bridge between here and the city. So how long is this going on? I mean, It, it took weeks. Um, when the first approach came in was May 5th, Okay. It took them six days to get to Charleston because they were burning the bridges, they were cutting trees down and leaving them in the road. So Marion, a uh, few of the members of the Second South were, were cutting these trees delaying, and a company of the raccoon, uh, the raccoon company from the uh, Catawba Indians, riflemen, were snipers, and were sitting on the road, would shoot at them, harass them. Prevost had no choice, he had to slow down, but he was also looting every plantation, right. every farm along the way. So we're in a well, way- he has, to, he has to feed his army. He's gotta right? feed his army. So we're winning by attrition in that sense that he keeps sending back a squad of men with supplies. So he's getting a little bit smaller, a little bit smaller, a little bit smaller. Till he arrives just outside of the racetrack, just uh, north or up the peninsula from the city of Charleston. Uh, Pulaski and his legion has arrived. So as Moultrie is pulling everyone in, they're starting to throw up these hasty defenses across the neck. When we say Pulaski, we're talking about the cavalry? Cavalry, Pulaski's legion. Didn't Pulaski have lances? Yes, he did. Didn't he take these lances into this fight? Yes, he did. Didn't he get slaughtered? Yes, he did. <laughs> okay. And it was not really, it was, a, it was a, he tried to execute an ambush. He had rifle, he had his own musketeers. So they actually built a kind of position near the racetrack. I'm going to go draw attention. So he rides forward, and he rides into a cavalry detachment of Georgia loyalists and get into a fight, and he's trying to lure them back to the ambush. The problem was his infantry was not ready. I see. So when the horses came in, there was no musket fire, and he got caught between them, and yes, a lot of his lancers got chewed up by Georgian loyalist cavalry, and they went back. I heard uh, Jim Pikich talking about that particular incident, and he was saying that Pulaski was trying to use those European uh, lancers in a way that just didn't fit the no. mold of the American battlefield. And he didn't go into the, the, the plan of the, you know, where he's trying to lure him back into Correct. the trap, but he did say that Pulaski was, was all for these lancers, but it was one of those things where... He quickly realized they're in, in, in a fatal moment for his group that uh, that Lancers just didn't work. They don't work in time in the South. No, <laughs> not in our swamps. Not in, Our fields are not, not the beautiful open terrain of Europe. No, our swamps and small farmlands, plantations we have are not suitable for Lancers. Wow, wow. So what happened then? So we Lincoln finally realized that, okay, this is no longer a fate. The city is in trouble, so he needs to march. Well, the problem is he already have his army on the Georgia side of the Savannah. As soon as Moultrie started to burn all the bridges, it's almost like someone fired a starting gun. All the militia started to disappear. They're going home. They're going home to defend their family. So the numbers are diminishing fast. Governor Rutledge, with about 800 men from Orangeburg, come down to start manning the city, and Colonel Anderson out of Camden with his militia come down. So they start digging a quick trench across the neck, uh, anchoring on the Cooper and Ashley Rivers. They actually had a swampy terrain, so they didn't have to do much, whereas the Cooper, they had put up abatis. The, they brought a couple of the warships from the South Carolina Navy to focus their guns. They brought the artillery up, so the, South, the Charleston militia was called. So we built one line of trenches with a redoubt on the left, a redoubt on the right, one to the rear called the Half Moon, which was the reserve, and one forward as an early warning. So the Charleston militia is on the left, and in the redoubt is Marion with half of the 2nd South Carolina Regiment. The right-hand side is... Governor Rutledge with his upcountry militia. The Ford position is the Camden militia, and the rear reserve is the other half of the second South Carolina with Pulaski's Legion. It's poor conditions. They have to bring out barrels of water. There's not even fresh water on the peninsula. Right. They're right. digging quickly. It's getting dark. And unfortunately, it was part of the fog and friction of war is it's really dark that night. Prevost arrives at dusk. So Moultrie opens fire, he orders all the cannons, commence firing. Well, eventually you can't see anything. So they have tar barrels in front of the trenches that they're going to light up so they have illumination. 
Well, the problem was Governor Rutledge and the upcountry militia are shooting at ghosts and shadows. They can't see nothing. All of a sudden, here's this fire flares up, and they see silhouettes. They start firing, and he ordered their cannons to fire, which causes a chain reaction to go up and down the line. We're trying to order, no, those are friendlies out front. It was not. It was. They actually, were in the forward redoubt. They're in a forward position, trying to light these barrels so we could oh, see the okay. field. The guys who were lighting the. the okay. And it was uh, Major Hugey from the first regiment, and twelve men were killed by friendly fire. It was unnecessary, but everyone got caught up in the moment with sure. so many, so many militiamen. They didn't know, and especially in that experience, you know, I've seen it in combat. I understand when it happens, but it was still a loss. Sure. And the next day. Uh, General Moultrie was very adamant. He was very upset. He goes, you know, there can't be two leaders. There can't be me and Governor Rutledge. We have to figure out who's in charge. So he actually went over and he pretty much told Governor Rutledge, this is what you were doing. I will be in command of all the military forces. I will defend this city to the best of my ability. You can negotiate. You can do all the social, whatever it is you want to do as a civilian leader is great. I will fight. You do this. And he agreed. Well, he started to negotiate with Prevost, and actually sent uh, General Prevost and his son forward to negotiate, which was simple, you will surrender unconditionally. And it didn't sit very well. He goes, not only you have to surrender unconditionally, but everyone's got to swear loyalty to the crown. Well, to Moultrie and all the, all the fighting men, no, we will not do this. We will defend to the very end. Whereas Governor Rutledge goes, let me think about that. And he said, well, can we do a counterproposal? Is if we surrender, can we keep the city open as neutral? We want to keep the port open. No one from the military wanted to present that. They, that sounded like they wanted to surrender. So they actually found uh, Colonel Lawrence, who's healing his wound in city. He goes, I'm not going to take this message. I refuse. I'm a patriot, and I'll fight to the end. We actually had to find two other volunteers to take the message out to Colonel Prevo, saying, well, we in the military will continue to defend, but the civilian government is looking at this. But luckily, Prevo said, no, it's all or none. Either surrender completely and swear loyalty to the king or we're going to blast you out. What do you think of Rutledge's decision on that? I can understand his point of view because if the city was subject to a siege, you're going to lose your city. You're going to have buildings burning. All the civilians are going to get caught in there. And he's, he's probably worried about that. Not as necessarily the, the military aspect, but he was as the civilian leader, he was worried about consequences. The, the, what's going to happen to the women and children in the city? How much of the city is going to burn? I don't think he, I mean, he was leading troops. And Rutledge has been fighting since day one. He showed great determination in 76 that he was sending over gunpowder to Sullivan's Island where we couldn't get gunpowder from the actual army. So he's not that he's afraid to fight, but I think he was worried about the consequences. If that proposal was accepted, Charleston was the capital city of South Carolina Correct. at the time. Is he basically capitulating South Carolina toward He was to only staying in the city. Point. I think when the stipulation was the city would remain neutral as to keep the port open. I see. Trade. Keep the money coming in. You can have the city, but it's it, you're going to have the city, but you're not really going to have the city. It, we're not. You're not fully under British control. We're a neutral city now. We, we don't care what happens. We haven't get up the state, but we definitely lost. It will be a strategic loss to us. It will be morale loss. In fact, we just lost not just Savannah and Augusta, Georgia. We just lost Charleston. They're on a roll. What are we going to do now? So it... It could so you're so you're hesitant about about blaming Rutledge no. and, and saying that uh, that he was really just turning coat. I don't think he was turning coat. I think he was trying to look at the bigger picture, which in some cases, in a military sense, is hard. As a military man, you understand military tactics. You know that sometimes you have to take losses to gain a victory. When you're a civilian leader, though, you don't want losses. You don't want women and children on the street, um, houses burning, especially as compact Charleston was. One or two good shots, and you could have this uncontrolled fire in the city that nothing can stop, you'll lose everything. So regardless, Prevost didn't take that. He did not. He, in fact, he they pulled the entire army out. We called his bluff. He actually withdrew. At that point, we're trying to go, okay, we need to do something. So at that point, we're getting ready to pursue. Had General Lincoln moved faster, because we kept Prevost in position for about two days, had Lincoln arrived with the army, so you're looking at 3,000 men, on the outside, with Prevost's army in between a city, you had a hammer and an anvil that you could have squashed his army between us. How many people did he have? He only had about 2,000 men. How many did, did the Americans have? 4,000 or better. If you count all the militia, it was, it's hard to get total numbers because, again, your companies come in, companies sure, go Lincoln, in. Lincoln's coming in from one side with how many? 4,000 men. 
and then you have the men that are that are holding stationary. About a thousand men in Charleston. Yes. So he 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 literally could have had it between. Yeah, three to one. Right. Yeah, three to one ratio. We had artillery. We had a lot more artillery in the defense. Uh, Lincoln had artillery. Had cavalry. Had all the different things. Had we caught them, and this is one of the things we've discussed as military historians, being Monday morning quarterbacks. Okay, what well, what well, if that would have happened? Maybe we wouldn't have had the fall of Charleston. If we took out already General Prevost and the majority of the Southern British Army, maybe we wouldn't have lost Charleston. Maybe we could have continued. Maybe we could have gone in and took Savannah. Then we could have did what he did. Now there's no British Army. Let's march now. Let's retake Savannah. It's only sure. being cut by a regiment versus a year later we come back. Sure. And then you know. Was Prevost operating on his own? Initially? Prevost was operating on his own. He was not coordinating with Clinton no, or, or not at all. Cornwallis or any of those? Not at all. Wow. It, it was, again, he sent, he sent Campbell up to take Augusta and hold it. Even after a while, Campbell goes, there's nothing really here to hold. He came back. He brought his men back. Whereas Prevost, he goes, originally, yes, I was just going to do this as a feint, grab some cows, get some you know, food. But then he saw there's nothing between him and the city. Who dares wins? He, he rolled the dice. He could have been a hero. Unfortunately, he ended up zero at this moment. Just literally altered things for about another year. Wow. It could have ended the war sooner. or Who knows what it could have done to the Southern campaign. Well, what happened then? Well, we did pursue. Lincoln did arrive about two days later. At that point, he did actually order the army out, and we pursued. So Prevost had no choice. He had to get to some place where he can get his men across and get supplies, and he ended up going to Stono Ferry. So he knew that the Americans were coming with a vengeance. So he built three redoubts facing the the crossing points. He put some Hessians, he had the 71st, he had provincials all ready to go. He had some artillery. The Legion had arrived with cavalry. All they were doing is making sure the men get across the river. Lincoln's intelligence was a little bit off. When he when he arrived outside of Stono Ferry, he knew that the the his forces had deployed. So he deploys his men in the light of battle about a mile away. Oh, really? And started walking them ah. in. So the men were kind of tired. Sure. By the time they arrived. What, uh, what, what month is this? This is now, we're looking at June. Oh. So everyone's favorite weather down here in, in the Carolinas going into Georgia. It's now June. Uh, the heat is coming up. The malaria, yeah. the mosquitoes are starting to get out. No seams. No seams are getting um. So they're advancing up. So he deploys, uh, basically, he. For the most part, the South Carolinians, with mostly of them being militia, were deployed to the right. The North Carolinians were deployed to the, or excuse me, the South Carolinians to the north. South or the North Carolinians to the to the south. He had cavalry, he had artillery. They came up and they started blasting away. Well, the problem is they didn't realize there was a marsh and stream between them and the redoubts as they're advancing. And it started out as a, all the riflemen started fire on the far left of the English line where the Hessians were at. We're doing a pretty good job of keeping the Hessians' head down in their Jaeger. So they're advancing up. So kind of in a staggered way, the Americans are coming up. They're advancing, they're advancing, they're advancing. The lights are fighting a small picket from the 71st. And they're going back and forth. And as they're advancing, they run into this large stream that they can't cross. And it's in range of the redoubts. So the British open up this massive volley. They're firing from their adults. The, the Americans are standing there fighting toe-to-toe. The South Carolinians literally deploy, they come up in a column. They decide to change, and not in line where everybody else. They come up in column, and just in front of the of this picket of the 71st, deploying to line and let them have it. The firing is so brutal on our left, there was only eight men standing from the 71st picket. They had no choice but to retreat back into the redoubt. At that point, Lincoln's stuck. He can't cross the stream. He can't get across the redoubt or to face the redoubts, they're firing up, he's taking casualties, he's, and then he's starting to realize we're running out of ammunition. Uh -huh. In the distance, he sees British reinforcements coming. So his one true victory is the riflemen actually drive the Hessians out of the redoubt, get up onto the redoubt itself, and were caught by the flank by English gunboats who opened fire with cannons. They were, they were shooting at some of the Hessians were actually being shot, getting in their boats to try to row away until these gunboats came up. So the, the, the riflemen had to fall back, the militia starting to fall back. The, but we did fall back in good order. We actually didn't run, we did not panic. We pulled our, our wounded with us, we pulled our guns with us. We did a little standing fight on the left. 71st now really upset at us, charges out of the redoubt to come attack our Madrid, and we sent our cavalry to stop them. And the 71st, in proper military order, stopped and repelled cavalry. 
Their first rank took a knee with bayonets facing out. The second rank stood and fired over him. It did drive the cavalry back, but Lincoln was able to retire his force under good order. He just had no ammunition. It came down to, again, Murphy being alive and well, bad intelligence. He ran out of ammunition. He was was starting to collapse the, the, the British line, even with redoubts. They were collapsing on the run. And he ran out of ammunition. And I, I think it gets back to our understanding of war now compared to the, you know, the realities of war back then. I mean, now you go into combat. I mean, you know this better mm-hmm. than I do, but you obviously have a lot more ammunition now that you're able to carry with carry with right. you into combat. They didn't have that ability. Yeah, it was very. Easy. I was carrying what we call double basic loads. A lot of times, I was carrying anywhere up to from 600 to 1,000 rounds of ammunition. Each individual foot soldier back then carried about 30 to maybe 60. Right. And in a sustained firefight, if your musket is working well, you go through 20 rounds really quickly, and you're trying to pull out things from your haversack. They didn't, you don't actually have these, you know, they had some folks out there with extra cartridges that they tried to resupply, but it's not the same it is today. So when you start to get really low, you're really low. That's why you find on these battlefields, whether it be Hopkirk Hill mm-hmm. uh, or Battle of Camden or any of these battlefields, you find a whole bunch of intact balls. Yes. If you find a ball that's mushroomed, they hit flattened, something. it hit something. Yeah. But you find a whole lot of intact balls where they're trying to fumble around. They drop their cartridges. And drop it in, yes. in, in the heat of battle, heat of battle. sort of thing. So thank you so much. Well, let me ask you this. Let's tell our listeners one more time how they can get your book. Again, the In the Presence of Wolves is, can be found on Amazon or through his publisher, which is Mascot Books. The second book called In the Fury of Wolves also can be found on Amazon or through the publisher Strategic Book Club or the uh, strategic book publishing. Well, thank you so much, Eric. I appreciate your time, and uh, I hope our listeners really get a sense for the passion that you have for, for the Revolutionary War and, and that time period that, that really our liberty as this nation hung in the balance. So thank you. Yes, sir. <laughs>